You know, there is a very interesting phenomena going on today, and I'd like to talk about it first. There's a whole new movement in philosophy called philosophical counseling. One of the most interesting thinkers in this field is a woman by the name of Shmoment Schuster. I probably mispronounced the name. S-C-H-U. No. She practices philosophical counseling as an alternative to psychotherapy. And what's most interesting is that when clients come to her, and she has an office in Israel, and she works out of Israel, she finds that before she can do any work, she must first critique, challenge the very language they use. She challenges the language her clients use to rid it, to purge it, of psychological and psychotherapeutic language. Because as she's found, if these ideas go unexamined, it distorts the entire interview and it sets up goals implicit in psychotherapy and therefore makes philosophical counseling and its goals difficult to reach. So what does she think? She says that what she must do is critique psychotherapy and psychotherapeutic language, especially psychoanalysis, from her clients. I think that was really wonderful, very fine insight. I would go further. I would say that we cannot get into classic philosophy until we could critique Aristotle. Nearly all philosophy, and after this talk, if you would just do one thing, you'll see exactly the truth of this. Go into any book in philosophy, Introduction to Philosophy, History of Philosophy, and look up the thinkers that we are going to talk about this evening, and you will find that they, all the things that are said about these thinkers come out of Aristotle. Why is that significant? Because to jump ahead later, when we have the actual fragments of these thinkers, we'll compare what the fragments say against what Aristotle says, they say, and we'll give him a grade. The difficulty with the thinkers we're going to be dealing with today is that they are, there is no extent, and there is no literature in existence from the classic age that contains any direct quotes from these thinkers. They're all in secondary sources, and a good part is drawn from Aristotle. Now, there are other thinkers who contributed to what these thinkers thought, but they are not included in the textbooks. And therefore, since this is a class really an introduction of philosophy as a wisdom tradition, I, I would prefer talking about these thinkers from contemporary thinkers or people who lived after them, but who could reflect back on their work so we can get a fresh and different view of these early thinkers. Because the thesis I'm going to present is, there was no beginning in philosophy. It blossomed full, brilliantly. It had no evolution. You see, if you read Aristotle, everything he wrote about the people that preceded him, all the preceding thinkers, he sees as merely thinkers who were simply his predecessors leading up to what he himself thought. And therefore, he sees himself as king of the hill. We're going to challenge that <clears throat> when we get into the kinds of writings where we have direct quotes from the authors, but we won't be able to do that this evening because the primary material that we have on these thinkers comes from Aristotle and later thinkers. What did we say about that? We said that history books just stay with Aristotle said about him, thinking that Aristotle was a good guide for the understanding of his contemporaries and those that came before him. We're going to show that's not the case. And we'll do that in succeeding talks. So, what are we going to talk about this evening? The dawn of philosophy coming from three primary thinkers. Here they are. Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes. They're the thinkers we're going to deal with. Now, how are we <clears throat> notice how we're going to approach it. 
Everybody knows what, how Aristotle sees these people, and I can just go over it, and then I'm going to put aside what Aristotle says about these thinkers, and then go to people who existed at the time or came after him and reflected upon their thought, and you'll see the difference between the two. Now, Thales was said, according to Aristotle, to have said that the basic element in all existence is water, and that's the primary element. And that's how Thales saw the whole universe and everything about it. The first principle and basic nature of all things is water, says Aristotle, claiming to represent Thales. And the earth rests upon water, and all things are full of gods, and the magnetic stone has soul because it sets the iron in motion. These are the four basic quotes. That's all exists from Aristotle's view of Thales. That's the whole thing. Now we're going to use other thinkers. And we do so, I think you're going to find something different. So let's take a look at what other contemporaries and people who came after Thales said he thought, rather than stay with those four statements of Aristotle. Now, in order to play the game, let me jump ahead and tell you what, get a quick view of what we're going to say about philosophy so it's much easier to see. Primarily, there is an ultimate. Then there's mind or what is intelligible. And then that intelligibility is in soul. And this is the basic pyramidical structure of all classic philosophy. This is sometimes called the good or the one in Plato and other thinkers, by the way, the one. This is called the intelligible, sometimes called mind and soul, you already know. Now, what's interesting about this is that philosophers have to not only account for the existence of these things, but to talk about how it's possible to proceed upward through these to successively reach what's intelligible or mind and the ultimate by the use of mind alone by use of reason, by use of reason plus contemplation. This is the model, this is philosophy. It's true for all Neoplatonic thought, it's true for all the thinkers. Now let's take a look at Thales. This is what other thinkers thought Thales said. The first thing you see, <coughs> He said is that God is the same as mind. Right? God is the same as mind. But mind in the universe. So therefore, Thales saw, now this is from Atticus, Atticaius, A-C-T-I-U-S. He said Thales had this view that God is the same as mind in the universe. That is to say, the vast universe taken in its totality, there is plenty of evidence of mindfulness throughout the entire universe. That's what he's calling God. Look here. He said it's also, the universe is full of spirit, or spirits, plural, singular. And through the whole thing, there is a divine moving power that pervades element, uh, the elemental nature. Look here. That is to say, right, there's a divine moving power through the whole thing, through the universe, through everything. Soul, therefore, is in motion, must be in motion, because there's a divine moving power that pervades the elemental nature of what is. So look here, what's soul? When I got here tonight, I got here because I had a plan how to get here. I commanded myself to do it. I wanted to do it because I thought it would be a benefit to me and perhaps to others to talk about these things. 
and therefore there's something in me that cares, that has a care for what I'm doing. There's something in me that commands, and there's something in me that plans. And as a consequence, I got in my car and got here by directing the car through its various configurations to get here. You also have telemetry. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And uh, what this is in, in classic Greek thought is soul. That's what they mean by soul. And therefore, I could push myself into motion. See, soul is always in motion. And look here. Since the divine power is the moving power that pervades the elemental nature of all things, then if that's true, if this power pervades the entire universe, my soul must have that same power and it moves. Therefore, by conclusion, the gods are blended in all things. Now, oh, Thales was quite interesting. He studied in Egypt. All of these thinkers, by the way, were from Miletus or Milesian, the cities of Milesian or around Miletus, which we would now call uh, on the western side of Turkey in the Aegean Sea. Now look, there was a big discussion about how you could determine the height of the pyramids. And he said, excuse me, he said, what to do is simply stand and whenever you see that the sun casts a shadow and that shadow is exactly the same as your height, then merely at that same time mark where the shadow of the pyramid is and you will then be able to judge with great accuracy the height of the pyramid. He was a very unusual creative thinker. He was ridiculed by his fellows because he was into philosophy and speculation. And so he decided that a good thing to do would be to show people that a philosopher also has a mind. And so since he was interested in the heavens and he was able to uh, take great interest in astronomy, he realized, according to what I do not know, but he anticipated there would be a heavy olive crop by the heavy rains that came that year. And so in the middle of the winter, he went around and he bought up, borrowed money, bought up, leased all of the olive presses. There was a great harvest of olives and he sat back and he said, I'll rent you my olive presses and made a mint. And therefore they changed his opinion. They changed their opinion of Thales. He was also extremely interesting. He was also acted uh, as an advisor to the military. There was a campaign going on and troops had to cross a river. It was difficult to ford the river. So he said, I think I know a way to do that. He just simply went upstream and got the troops to dig a passage so that therefore the stream was split in two and they waded across. It's this play between the everyday world and philosophy that marks all of these thinkers that we're going to explore. Now look, let's go back. As you now look at Thales, let me go back to what Aristotle says. Remember what he said? The first principle and basic nature of all things is water. Is there a difference? Well, one thing I must add here, you see, when he said a divine moving power pervades the elemental nature of things. He said that is moisture or water, since everything can be said to flow. Would you not agree that's a quite interesting image because if you have a camera, as you know, if you uh, speed up any process going, you can see the whole thing going in and out, flowing as it were. So it's an interesting metaphor, but that's not the central point. The central point is in here. Therefore, when Aristotle pulls out and says to, about Thales that the first principle and basic nature of all things is water, according to Thales, yes, he did say that, but he said far more interesting things, which his contemporaries picked up, rather than Aristotle. Now, who are these people I've been quoting up there? Well, the uh, most interesting thinker, um, 
um, this Simplicius and his uh, commentaries, um, Adius, uh, I was going to write with this, and uh, Plutarch, and that's where I got these quotes, and Diogenes Laertes, and these are the primary thinkers who were talking and reflecting upon the works of Thales, and we can compare, therefore, their view, it's represented here, and what Aristotle represents as Thales. We do not agree there's a difference? So let's go for the second. Now, it's very interesting, you see, because when we move from Thales to Anaximander, these are all people who lived in the same area, Miletus, in what we now call Turkey. And Anaximander was a student, he worked with Thales, worked alongside of Thales, and so too did, uh, did uh, Anaximenes work with Anaximander. But I would like to talk about this diagram in one minute. And Eximander did this. He said, look here, Thales was quite correct in his view, but he added to it. Now, let's first get our friend Aristotle and see what he says about it. Here is the entire quote, one quote, that Aristotle has on this man. The unlimited is the first principle of things that are. It is from which the coming to be of things and qualities take place, and it is that into which they return when they perish by moral necessity, giving satisfaction to one another and making repatriations for their injustice according to the order of time. That's the whole statement. That's what Aristotle says, that an Eximander And therefore, we build up a view of him from Aristotle based upon that quote. I would like to go to other sources. And again, I'm using the same kinds of sources as before. Um, and um, the, only new, the only new one that I'll mention is what is called pseudo-Plutarch. So let's take a look. First, Eximander did something quite interesting. He, he designed a whole series of sundials. He created a map of the heavens, and he made a celestial map, and he saw it as spheres, and within it he located the stars. He said, as far as the evidence it is that you can only say that the sun, the most brightest object in our heavens, is a pure fire. With the maps and the celestial maps he made, many of the early mariners, mariners traveled through the uh, Mediterranean Sea. How successful, I, I, obviously, I hope was uh, successful. Let's take a look at what he said now, according to the other sources. Now, what's quite interesting is this notion, and let's see if I can draw you into it. I think you would agree that whatever you experience in this world, whatever it is, is something curious. The only thing you ever see is color. Right. The only thing you ever see is color. You infer that there's an object behind the color, but the only thing you ever see is color. That is to say, the only thing you ever see are color, and color is a quality. But you don't hear words, you hear sounds. Right. The primary data coming into you is color and sound. These are the qualities. Now, as different things take on different colors, so we call them different things. 
Now, what's behind the quality? What's behind the quality? What is the stuff behind this colored thing? Behind this colored thing? Behind this color? What is it behind all of the qualities? Because would you not agree, as far as our experience is concerned, all we see is things taking on different qualities, size and shape and colors and sound. Therefore, what if we just stay with that? Then let us say what we really have here is a, a vast reservoir of qualities. And things, what we call things, emerge from here with qualities, and then they go through processes of destruction, and the qualities simply return. Therefore, the basic reservoir, it, reservoir is a reservoir of all the qualities. And everything is just a mixture of different qualities. But the qualities themselves must always be a particular source and a return, and therefore, overall, there's a balance. Now, what is the particular stuff itself? That is unlimited. The basic stuff of the universe is basically unlimited. That's no limit. That's no limit. Unlimited. It's the qualities that are added to them that give it the size and shape and the character that they have. Therefore, you see, what's really going on in this unlimited vitality that's going on is simply the development and return. And an examiner had a very fine idea. He said, look here, you can understand man, the whole development of man, from child to death. You can see the whole rise of cities. You can see the whole rise of cities. You can see the whole rise of cultures as nothing other than the rise and the fall and therefore the return to these basic qualities back to their source, the great reservoir. And therefore, what's most important to see is that everything fits this, comes out of, returns, the rise and the fall of all things. For that's how everything is ordered. The stuff itself is unlimited. Therefore, there's opposites. This comes, this returns. Coming, returning. Two primary opposites. The world itself is unlimited because the basic stuff behind it all is qualityless. It's unlimited, formless. And now, when we take this view and we consider it for a few minutes, we can come back and we can say, is this how we understand the man? Is this how we understand? Huh? Because Anaximander is one of the fundamental thinkers. But Aristotle just says, the unlimited is the first principle, that's true. It is that from which coming to be of things and qualities take place. That's true. It's that to which they return when they perish. They give satisfaction to one another in making repatriation for their injustice. Therefore, in this exchange, it's a moral universe. Because everything finally balances out. Now, I would like to now quote a few things that come from other thinkers. First of his engineering. He was the first to draw a map containing all the outlines of land and sea. He constructed a global chart of the sky. called the earth spherical. He said the sun is of the purest fire. Who is this? Who is this? Same thinker. Who is saying this? Yes. Simplicus. Simplicius. S-I-M-P-L-I-C-I-U-S. -I 
And he's reflecting on an ex and This is what he's saying. He thought he said. So I have one good quote I'd like to share with you. He was the successor of Thales. And he said that the ultimate source and first principle, as well as the primary substance, is the unlimited. The four elements change into one another. He asserts that not, not any one of them is elemental. The coming to be does not involve any alteration of the basic substance. Now, this is really quite interesting. He said that everything comes to be from earlier forms. Animals came to be from vapors rise by the sun. Man came into being from an animal other than, other than himself, namely a form of fish, which in early times he resembled. He says, too, that in the earliest times men were generated from various kinds of animals. For whereas the other animals can quickly get food for themselves, the human infant requires careful feeding for a long time after birth, so that if he had originated suddenly, he could never have preserved his own existence. Plutarch. Anaximander says that men were originally generated in the bodies of fishes, and after birth they were reared in the way that sharks are reared, until they became capable of protecting themselves, and that eventually they were cast ashore so that they had to learn to live on dry land. Therefore, he worked out principles of evolution, didn't he? Now they're looking at the everyday world, as we do. They see all the qualities moving. They say, therefore, the qualities can't be real. There must be something behind it that is real, and that's the unlimited. It has no form. But it has something very important, and this is what he calls the divine. Behind it all, there is an intelligibility forming in a variety of species, and man is one of the emergent species, taking on different qualities because the whole thing is nothing other than the divine emerging. Therefore, you can see the whole rise and fall of species, of states, of cities, of man. It's nothing other than coming out of this one reservoir of qualities. And given the right time, everything emerges. For time is what orders whatever emerges. Therefore, time is really elemental. Therefore, everything is ordered. It's ordered by time. It's ordered by successive changes that take place. And all the things that change that allow the divine to emerge from it, that is the unlimited. That's the divine. He called that unlimited, right, the Aperion, A-P-E-I-R-O-N, Aperion. It's the great reservoir through which the unlimited, the formless, which is the divine, takes on all of these qualities and experiences all of these things in the variety of ways in which it does. He saw nature as ordered. He started doing some great work in the natural world the first to create maps, as we were talking about, and sundials, and began exploring principles of astronomy. So, the third thinker in this group. Now, and 
Now, the uh, primary vision that we get from both Thales and Anaximander is this great diagram that I've drawn here. And Anaximandes takes this image a step further. What is it? That there is some primary substance out of which things emerge and return. Right? It's this basic model. And what's moving? Formless yet divine. Therefore they see this as a divine process I'll find, right? A divine process where the divine itself has no qualities or is formless and it gains its qualities as it emerges only to return later. Well, that's a very interesting view. Now, let's go to Annex Mananese. He introduced a very important notion that we were alluding to in the beginning, serial order. The originating principle behind everything is a serial order. That means we have the introduction of a hierarchy. Now, we only have a few quotes of his. We'll quote that from Aristotle. Then I'll go to the other sources, as I did before, in order to make the point. All right. Now, I suggest that, every, that you can become an expert on Anaximenes in, a, in, a, in just one evening. Here we go. Because there's only one sentence that has survived of Anaximenes. And if you know one sentence, you know everything that he wrote. As our souls being air hold us together, so breath and air embrace the entire universe. That's what Aristotle claimed. Uh, the basic idea of Anaximenes, one sentence. So he's moving from water to air, but it's going to take on an interesting dynamic. Now, I would like to use another diagram for an examinees. And you'll see he's doing the same thing, adding to it. The soul. Remember what we called soul? It's still the same idea. It's the Greek idea. If there are these three qualities, planning, commanding, taking care. If it has that reflective quality about it, because if you take care or you seek to benefit yourself, then it's reflective, it's re recursive. You're talking about yourself, you're concerned with yourself, and so you plan. On the basis of that plan, since you think you're going to benefit, you then command yourself to do it. Now these are different. If they're different, then there's something must be there that holds them all together so they can function together as a unity. This, the chair, everything, everything that can be said to be in existence must have a unity of its parts. There must be something that holds it together, whatever you want to call that stuff. There must be a unity of the parts, or there's disintegration and decay. So, so long as the thing is in existence, there must be a unity. There must be some inherent property that keeps things together. That's the first thing that Anaximenes pointed to. He said, you know what? He said there's an inherent principle in all things, from the smallest to the greatest. And that fundamental thing is a unity, a unitary force that keeps things together. It's an inherent principle of everything. Now, what is it? Well, he said what it is, you see, what it is, and he uses a word which is very important. He says the essence of everything, the essence. 
The fundamental essence of this quality, that recursive property, that unitary power that keeps everything together, whatever it is, is one. So he finds the one in everything, and therefore this is the great one-many problem. And he's saying, I think I grasp the nature of what underlies all things, the many things that are, tables, chairs, golf clubs, politicians, cold bottles of beer and whatnot. There has to be some unity that keeps it together and therefore there's a basic essence in everything in the entire universe and that essence is one. Permeates everything. That one is, and he picked up the term from previously, it's unlimited, it's unlimited, it's unlimited and therefore it can express itself in, in, in num innumerable ways. It's invisible, naturally, it's invisible. There's a unitary power, you can't see it, but that's the thing that allows everything to be what it is. Now, try this now. Let's see if we can turn this around for a moment. I want to take a page for a moment. I was thinking about this the other day. There's a very fine book on cellular pathology by the name, uh, the author's name is Virchow. And Virchow, in studying the cell, raised this very interesting question. He said, any cell at all that you're talking about has a wall, has a wall to contain it. And there's a nucleus that seems to direct its activities. There must be some way to get nourishment and some way to take out wastes. In the smallest cell, therefore, there is an intelligible force going on here. He says, what is that? What is it? Well, we're taught to believe that it's the nucleus. That's the center of the intelligibility. And Virchow says, wait a minute. In the material, that nourishment that came in to sustain, support, sustain the cell, there wasn't a nucleus that came in, wasn't a baby nucleus that came in there. All there was was this nurture, this nurturing fluid that came through. So he turns everything up, up he turns everything over and he says, we think of structure. He said, we think of structure as the important element in a cell. And therefore, since we think of structure, hard things, forms, he said, we miss the truth of the nature of a cell. He says, no, he said, what it really is, is that life, that life sustaining stuff that comes into the cell that's the stuff later that becomes part of the cell wall when it needs to be repaired. That's the stuff that takes on the nucleus. That's the stuff that's, that's therefore is sent around in various places. What sends it around? He says, don't think about the structure of the cell. The fluid that comes in is intelligible. That's the intelligible thing. It just takes on various functions as it's required. That's the vitality. That's the vitality, and that vitality has an intelligibility to it. So much so that in any structure, whether you move from a cell or an organ, you have a structure that's maintained by a vitality of what flows through it. And since it can repair itself, where is the intelligibility but in the stuff that flows through it? That's what maintains its unity of parts so that it can function for a higher purpose. Well, what is this unity that does this since it maintains and comes through the cell? Now we shift gears. I believe this is what another way of expressing the same thing, because Anaximenes, you see, is saying, 
there is an essence and it's one. And whatever, see, according to whatever form it takes for itself, so it becomes that thing. Whatever that energy that comes into the body, then as it nourishes different things, that stuff itself is intelligible. So therefore, according to the kinds of things it forms itself into, so it becomes the thing it informs. But the stuff itself is homogeneous. The stuff itself is intelligible, and it has a unitary power, an inherent principle in it, which can keep all the parts together so that it functions on a higher level. How does he put this now? Now, all we have is just a few quotes from these people. And the one that I would like to show you and go back to is this one, because in this one, I would say, is the vehicle through which all Greek philosophy emerges. Because we already have the terms, but we need one principle so that we can then apply it rigorously and we won't have any trouble going further in philosophy because of that. Right. One philosophical tool, as it were, the primary tool for philosophical investigation. Let's see if we can find it together. All right, now we have everything here, so let me take off a bit. What is it that keeps the soul together? And Examine says, air. That's the stuff, that's the nurturing stuff that comes to us. And what's interesting in the Greek, and especially you find this in Homer, the word psyche, which is our word for, that's the Greek word for soul, right? Psyche. In its root meaning, means breath. You are alive so long as you have breath. When you lose your last breath, your soul perishes. Well, then the stuff that maintains it is breath, vitality of breath. It's the vitality of breath that then sustains and is the unity of all living things. So an examine says, given the soul, you know what the soul is? Well, what in these functions, the way it functions, the thing that holds it together, the thing that holds it in a unity, is breath. Or, as he calls it, air. The vitality in the air, in breath. That's what holds it together. Just as the fluid in the cell is the very vehicle through which sustains and uh, brings into existence all of the diverse elements of a functioning cell, so breath in the soul brings us a vitality through which we can then plan, benefit, and command because it contains within itself not just H, right? A particular chemical that we need. There is a vitality to it, and through it there's an intelligibility that can emerge. This is his statement now. As the air holds us together, as the air holds us together, so too, breath and air holds the entire universe together, permeates the universe. That's it. Now, what philosophical tool is this? Well, look at the structure now. Let's see if we can look at the structure because this becomes the primary tool for all metaphysics and philosophy. The soul, the soul's unity is to air as the uh, universe Right? The universe's unity is to air and breath.
Now, what have we discovered here? This is a four term analogy. This is the first expression, direct expression of analogy because the soul's unity, A, is to B, air, as the universe, C, is to air and breath, D. Why? This is, this is what we now call the archetypal analogy. A is to B as C is to D. Once you begin to see that you can make analogies in the universe, once you see that, once you accept that principle, then you have a principle to show at parallels and you show something which is, uh, can be simply stated as a structural similarity. That's what you get. You see, if the universe, if the entire universe has certain properties which can be ordered hierarchically, well, let's put it on a, on a uh, contemporary level. If, the, if there's something about the way in which a well-ordered family functions and how parents can bring about a sense of justice through all the travail of family life, if they can keep the family together, that very skill someone then can use in an enlarged family, a clan. One can take the skills one learns from the family to an enlarged family or clan, and they can then see that the very skill in the one can be transferred to the other. Ah, one more step. The very insights that one can discover on what makes a family function together, ideally, then the same kinds of ways of dealing with things can help a larger family, what I'm loosely calling a clan. The same principles then can be established in terms of a city. Mm. If the same dynamics, family, clan, city, or the empire, or the state. What are we saying? We're saying that there's something that is learned on one, that you can find evidence in the, sec the need for it in the second, the third, or the fourth. That's the principle of structural similarity. I'm saying that in the way in which this language is structured, there is already an analogy in, at place. It's a relationship between the individual and the universe. As the soul's unity is to air, so to the universe. They're seeing a hierarchical ordered structure, aren't they? Could this not have been the inheritance of a legacy from Egypt, wherein they acknowledge the law of correspondence, or otherwise known as the hermetic axiom? Oh, sure. So, so it's not necessarily a discovery on their part, but just a reformulation of an acknowledgement of, of a law already known. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. There's no doubt about the fact that in classic studies, uh, Haley studied in Egypt. That's where he went to study his geometry. There's no doubt. One of the biggest missing pages in history, there are two, as far as I can see. One is the contribution of the Phoenicians, and the other is the contribution of the Egyptians. And what we need is text to come out to make that connection tighter. Oh, I certainly agree with you. And especially in, in uh, mathematics, astronomy, art. Oh, yeah, fast, medicine. Wouldn't you think that yeah. the, the Eurocentric yeah. and ethnocentric tradition of scholarship that we've inherited in the West has been a, an obstacle to that discovery to some degree? Uh, from what I understand, that, that certainly may play a role in it. The other problem is cracking her, you know, the, the problem of hieroglyphics and capturing abstract thought. That's the, it's, it's very difficult. It's no doubt that they had an oral tradition. Uh, you, you see, we only, see, when people talk about the classic world, like we're doing tonight, 
you know that we're not talking about any more than eight sentences when we're talking about these three thinkers. And we're getting them from someone called Aristotle who lived many years later, 200 years later or more. And we're forming ideas of what they said based upon Aristotle. I'm using other sources for this. So uh, let me put it another way. The great tragedy, one of the greatest tragedies that I know of in terms of my interest is the fire of Alexandria, Alexandrian Library. Uh, that's what we needed. That's what we need to piece together. So I, I don't think it's Eurocentricism. Uh, or at least a possible con contribution there. Pardon? Couldn't that be a partial contribution? I mean, even when we look at Egyptian hieroglyphics, as, as predominantly as we know them today, they've been interpreted by people who have a Christian perspective in terms of their translation, which naturally hmm. biases their perspective. Oh, well, that's, that's natural. Yeah, they're quite true. It's so quite it's natural. But it's our ability yeah. to be able to look at them yeah. more objectively is still in its incipient stage. That's uh, nothing I'm suggesting tonight would, would uh, be in any way uh, challenge that. No, no, I, go, I would certainly go along with that. I would go further and say that, uh, see, if we could only find one book of medicine of theirs, uh, one work on geometry, one book on astronomy, it would break the ice. Are you familiar with any of the, uh, the recent uh, controversial um, observations made by Robert Blava um, in terms of the Giza necropolis being a ver veritable replica of the constellation of Orion uh, in, in about 10,500 BC? Well, I'm, I'm not into, uh, I don't doubt their parallels. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the Stonehenge architecture and sculpting, which was, you know, 2,500 years before the Greeks, uh, bears a certain very strict relationship between the, the heavens and the model of the heavens and the resulting architecture, and therefore I don't have any difficulty in tying those two together. But, I'm, but just to answer you, no, I don't know that work, and if you later give me the name of the book, I'll uh, add that to my reading list. The interesting thing about, about those recent discoveries, which are very controversial in Egyptology, is that it lends itself exactly to, to, your, uh, to your discussion here in terms of uh, the macrocosm being a reflection of the microcosm and vice versa. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's virtually an entire culture's yeah. investment over a tremendous period of time to replicate that, which in and of itself shows a tremendous mathematical achievement which oh. is not acknowledged. No, I, I don't know whether it's not acknowledged. Uh, I mean, I don't know anybody who, who doesn't know the superiority in many fields of the, that the Egyptians had. Certainly Herodotus mentions it, he acknowledges it. See, the difference, the difference here is that this work and the works of philosophy have to use words. We're stuck, we can only use words. So oral traditions and evidences of great archaeological works, we can't make the transition from archaeological treasures to theoretical thought. We need the concepts, see, we need the concepts, and therefore, unless they have a written language, that's all we can do. Okay. We can't read stones, and that's one of the tragedies. Perhaps that's though part of the genius of geometrical figures and the creation of those kinds of things, is that it, by inference, shows the degree of, of mentation achieved. Oh, yeah. um, so perhaps you know, oh, yeah. they, don't, they don't leave any kind of uh, linear thought or, or written form that we can oh. see, but we see it in, what, in their works. No yeah. doubt. No doubt. No doubt about it. I totally agree with you. Yeah. And we're amazed by it. We're absolutely amazed about what the Egyptians produced uh, thousands of years before the Greeks. No doubt about it. But what do we need? The first one who can bring up texts, words, the, the culture will shift to those words. You're, you're pointing out that this is a, the, the, like a prime philosophical tool, which is, you know, could be called a yeah. hermetic axiom or has been. Um, could also not the prime um, philosophical tool along with this be the Pythagorean idea that, that all things are created from numbers? No doubt about it, but they come later then. See, this is 600. And the belief is that Pythagoras came another hundred years later, which we'd like to touch on later. But this is still 600 BC. Yeah, oh yeah, this, 
when you're armed with the analogy and you move into number, then you can play on many levels and bring them together and find all kinds of interesting ways of talking and making distinctions. Oh, without a doubt, yeah, yeah. But as I say, this is the beginning, and what's interesting in it, there's already so much in the fragments that we can then show already has the seeds of later developments. And here's the irony is, the irony is that they may in fact have gone much further since we, we have no reason to believe that the little fragment that we have expresses the highest level of their reflections. Could you we, we don't have it. Could you give us any idea how, how this kind of naturalistic philosophy evolved in an era when the tradition was a Homeric one based upon the Iliad and the Odyssey? No doubt. Well, I mean, how did, how did this in Ionia evolve away from that tradition and what were the consequences of that? Yeah, okay. Um, you see, if you, if, um, you're quite right, you see, in order to get into the Greek world, you have to go through the door of Homer. But if you go through the door of Homer, you'll see that it's a very naturalistic world. And the order and the intelligibility of Homer, the appearance of each time of the gods and what they signify in terms of the context, the inner structure of the work, the way all the parts fit together, the architectonic structure of the Iliad and the Odyssey is, is astonishing. I mean, for those who go into it, uh, like I, I have. Uh, so that therefore there isn't such a great gap between the two. As an example, the great heroine, see, if you read Homer's Odyssey, you can see that the real hero of the Odyssey is Penelope. She's the, she's the great figure because she's the one who was able to give Odysseus a plan of action. Athena didn't, even though Athena was supposed to be his great goddess who directed many of his activities. But the way she directed it was she gave him courage and strength but not, not mind. Mind, the whole plan of how to deal with the suitors came from Penelope. In the end of the uh, story, um, well, it's not actually in the, in the end, uh, it's when uh, Odysseus goes down into Hades, he meets Agamemnon, and Agamemnon then praises his wife, Penelope, and contrasts her with Helen. Well, what's most remarkable, therefore, is that theme is picked up later in the work, and Penelope is said to be sung in the heavens. Her story is sung in the heavens by the gods, where Odysseus' story is sung by men. So she gains a much more powerful, uh, power, not powerful in terms of, of, of uh, powerful in terms of intelligibility, intelligence, directing, and therefore it. it uh, it's not mythological power, it's the power of intelligent craftiness of Penelope that makes the story successful. But going yeah, back but, to, yeah, it's a long way to talking about it. But back to the Iliad and the Odyssey, we're talking about uh, anthropomorphized, I mean, we're talking about God as representing principles of nature, and now we make a leap with the no, natural no, no, If you don't mind, not principles of nature. Well, see, so you can, if you yeah. want to get into the. From our perspective. The, well, it's. it's uh, if you would look at each time there's an occurrence of one of the gods in the Odyssey, right, and then you check the circumstances under which it appears, you'll find, as well as in the Iliad, but certainly in the Odyssey, that at each occasion there's a continuous identity of a state of mind that occurs throughout the entire story. The gods, therefore, represent states of mind more than natural forces. And the person who did some good work on this, by the way, is the Homeric gods of Otto. And I would really recommend the, the Homeric Gods by Otto, O-T-T-O. He's perhaps the most interesting insight into states of mind as represented by gods and goddesses in the whole Greek literature, or classic literature. Yeah, yeah. But then we reach a stage here in Ionia where we're speaking about then similar kind of, I mean, dealing in the same area where these philosophers talking in terms that are, are beginning, they're more abstract. They're not, they're not anthropomorphized in the same way as, uh, as you could say, you know, if you were talking about the universe or reality via the gods. You see, one of the interesting things in comparative literature and comparative religion is that there are very few cultures that have produced anthropomorphic gods. 
in reality, there are very few that have a sustained anthropomorphic image. See, we are inheriting a 19th century criticism of anthropomorphic gods. But I would advise you, you know, maybe we should sit down with a book on mythology of different cultures and see to what degree there is a consistent anthropomorphic god and how they function. You'll see that the Greeks are amazing in their difference. And Homer, of course. And the way in which they use myths. It's a very strict and follows a very strict analogical structure. Very strict, and I could work it out for you if you want some time. Like you can take one of Plato's myths and you can structure it out in it. You can fit all of the terms of the myth. You can put down all the states of mind as represented. You can then have a matrix of ideas. You can ch check them off as a table. It's, a, it's preeminently intelligible. Like mythical is not part of a myth, therefore. Okay, I'm taking the word myth and elevating it. Okay. I'm saying that it represents a very high composite of intellectual insights into a unity, rather than myth as mythical, trivial, oh, yeah. no, no, or mean, anthropomorphic, yeah. and therefore can be rejected. Well, I don't, I don't mean, no, no. I mean, I'm not no. suggesting anthropomorphic in itself is, is a trivial thing either. I no, guess. there's an ancient that really goes into this, a philosopher that really goes into this, that very few people study who is probably the most significant philosopher of the classic world. And the most important work in this whole area that you're interested in is a work called The Theology of Plato by Proclus. All right, let me give you that. All right. He is the uh, most systematic thinker in the classic world that brought together the entire corpus of Hellenic thought into a unity and brought it together as a systematic system and, uh, yeah, Proclus, called The Theology of Plato. And in that work, he does this very thing. He takes all of the gods and show how they represent philosophical principles and how those philosophical rep uh, principles can be represented in the schema. So that if you want to grasp how the ancients themselves saw their own deities, I'd go for this. And it'll, it'll completely change your view. And that's worthwhile. Very few people study Proclus, even though he is perhaps the greatest thinker of that whole period. More so than Plotinus, would you say? Oh, Plotinus. Plotinus, if you go back to this image, the one, the intelligible soul, soul and body matter, Plotinus takes on the Parmenidean structure, which is this as well. And Plotinus shows the relationships of how you can move from one level to the other and the kinds of considerations that are presupposed in such a movement, spiritual development. And he's, he is preeminent among that, being able to talk that way. Proclus, however, is taking the same structure and he is showing how you can take that and relate it to Plato's Parmenides, how every line fits into a philosophical structure. He shows you how all of the thinkers, the, the uh, thinkers that came before him, all the way including Plotinus, how they can be understood as contributing to this grand vision of philosophy that even includes the view of each of the gods into a final philosophical system where each part mingles together with other parts, making a coherent whole. He did the first major metaphysics, and if you want to get into pure metaphysics, you want to look at the theology, the elements of theology by this man. 211 propositions, which are ordered axiomatically into a, into a pure system. When this work, the, uh, the elements of theology, you see what happened is it went into, into uh, the Arab world, into the Islamic world, and they thought it was Aristotle, and therefore they called it the theology of Aristotle, and much to their embarrassment, it turned out to be Proclus, much later, several hundred years. But this is the major work uh, which went into and formed the basis of St. Thomas Aquinas and Albert Magus. I thought that they were uh, more influenced by, well, it's uh, yeah, that most people think thought this was Aristotle. No. So. Yeah, no, that's so right. That's, no, that's right. It's all it's all mixed. See, it's it's okay. all. If you shake out and put the right names on things, the medieval age, as they now say, 
didn't have a pure Aristotle because the Aristotle they got came out of Islamic Spain in the 11th century and it was heavily influenced by Neoplatonic thought. And therefore, later periods when now you get moderns who study Aristotle and they go into St. Thomas, they get very confused about what St. Thomas is doing. But if they go backwards and pick up these, this, these works, and especially the missing piece, the missing pieces with uh, Pseudo-Dionysius, because Pseudo-Dionysius looks like uh, an avid student of Proclus. And Pseudo-Dionysius laid the foundations for the whole Christian theology. But back to Aristotle, though, isn't, yeah. there, isn't there some controversy about, first of all, much of his extant writings theoretically were, were not written for publication per se, but either were uh, rhetorical uh, notes coming together of students or, or uh, like, Condensed Someone. versions of notes that he would be teaching students in. Well, that's that's what he did. So, but, but I mean, that a lot of things that we, I mean, there's a controversy that a lot of things we might attribute to, to Aristotle, uh, more had to do with people in the school who gathered the, the, oh. you know, these yeah. ideas together. Yeah. But that not he, that perhaps he didn't write all yeah. these things. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. But they, they use the title generally uh, as Aristotelian. Same thing with Saint Tom. I mean, same thing with Saint Paul. They say Paul's letters, and you know most scholars realize only half of them were written by St. Paul. But they, they're willing to call the whole thing by one name. And uh, it doesn't lose any integrity by them. Yeah. So that, um, you see, the, um, Plato takes this, this is the primary vehicle for Platonic thought, this four terminology. This is, the whole, this is what he develops. And his entire thought is an expression of this, and so too is it Proclus. Uh, and the other uh, tool, which is then crafted, is the three terminology. A is to B is B is to C. That mean analogy becomes the paramount tool. And uh, that comes out of Plato's Timaeus. And uh, the basic intelligibility, of course, can be found in uh, where we're going, which is Heraclitus. Because uh, Heraclitus equally is understood through the eyes of Aristotle, and we'll get a completely different view of it when we take a look at what he literally said, since we have plenty of fragments, over 100 fragments of his. Therefore, we can check his writings against what Aristotle said, Heraclitus said, and you can give him a grade, and you can see what kind of a scholar he was. You know, one thing you mentioned here, um, in terms of uh, Anaximander talking about uh, the four elements changed into the other, the idea of the four classical elements, sometimes when, I, when I'm studying the pre-Socratics like this, and obviously they, the different ones of them, Heraclitus with fire and, and these two with, with air and water, um, making one preeminent, I wonder how that, if that muddies that water, because obviously they spoke of fire, or water, and earth as, as the elements, not, not Watch. Yes. Okay. What? I'll do a little heretical. All right, a little heretical. No ancient Greek saw air, earth, water, and fire as elements. All right? Because this is modern use of language. When um, I can get you, even in what we're reading now, you'll see that when he talks about water as the fundamental element, what he's saying is everything flows through everything else. It's the principle, it's the principle of flow. It's the principle of everything flowing through everything else that he calls water. It's not literally water. Because when he says, and, 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 when an um, and examiner says that everything is water because you can see that uh, anything with moisture creates the conditions for life. Um, the seed is moist. He goes on and says everything that has any kind of life has a moisture to it. When it dries up, it dies and decays. So that's the principle. See, it's, a, it's, it's not water. It's not H2O. And the other thinkers are quite clear about the fact that it is not meant literally. It's a metaphor. It's not literal. We take it as these are the four elements because they, they function somewhat like oxygen and helium, et cetera, and hydrogen. No, 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 no. That's a modern view of elements. 
No, and I understand what, you know, yeah. the distinction yeah. on, that they were thinking of these things metaphorically, but what always puzzles me is, I mean, when, when you think about astrology, which modern astrology really derived from, uh, was formulated in Greece based upon inheritances from uh, Mesopotamia, but, but even back at that point, they were, they were using the metaphorical divisions of fire, water, and earth metaphorically, and, and to have these philosophers then point out air, fire, water as being prime, that mm -hmm. struck me as funny. You know, I mean, that, that they, would just, they would raise it above the other three. Um, okay. The way in which these elements or principles are related one to the other works out in terms of um, four major analogies, which we'll get into, all right? And it isn't elemental in our sense of the word, because what we mean by an element is that certain things must remain constant. No, no, they have something that can be related one to other, where something flows through all of those, and therefore each of the so-called elements are stages through which a divine force moves. So, uh, and, and therefore the two things which we were going to look at is there are two forces therefore in nature, a condensing, a condensing, and a rarefied, rarefying. One up, one down. There's a way in which these so-called elements pass from one to the other till they get to earth, but that's the same stuff that's going through it, condensing, compacting, and that creates at different stages what we affectionately call the elements. But that's not the way they're reading it. They're seeing that they are certain stages, as it were, that it goes through, and as it goes through these recognized stages, you can give it different names. But the thing that they want to count as primary is the process through the serial order. Let me give you a quote, and I'll, I think I'll give you a quote, in uh, Anaximenes, which is, uh, um, yeah, okay. Again, this is from Simplicus. An associate of Anaximander, Anaximander, excuse me. And he agreed with him that the essence of thing is one and unlimited. On the other hand, he declared that it is not indeterminate, but that it has a specific nature, air, which differs in rarity and density, right? Rarity and density, according to the kinds of things into which it forms itself. It changes in terms of the thing it forms itself because the thing that forms itself has various degrees of density and rarity. So therefore, there are only two primary qualities, density and liberation or, or rarity. Watch. Rare, rarefied, it becomes fire. Condensed, it becomes wind, then cloud. Then as condensation increases, it becomes successively water, earth, stones. Everything else is made up out of these rarefied and condensing. What's everything? So everything is made in through processes. It's the process that's primary. When we read the stuff through Aristotle's eyes, we think of it as elements. The Greeks really believed that the basic element in the universe was water. No, they didn't. Not from this. They believe that there are processes going on, and successively through these two powers or forces inherent in nature, as basic forces. So it goes through all of the stages which we call air, air, with fire. And therefore, you see, as I started by saying, we read the ancients through the eyes of Aristotle. That's the problem with ancient philosophy. And most colleges and universities, when they give lectures on philosophy, the professor wants to use Aristotle for a very good reason. You can quote him. He's definitional, and that makes for good tests. I know that's, that's a fact. It makes for good tests. If you want to give a lecture on Aristotle's metaphysics or use Plato's Timaeus, there are very few people who would ever opt for Plato's Timaeus go for Aristotle's metaphysics, and you can talk about it, you can name it, you can define it, you can put it into sentences. The sentences are memorable, it's easy to digest, it's easy to check whether someone understands it or not. But if you're dealing with a complex system of analogies that operate on three different levels, 
good luck. You're not going to be able to do that unless you see it with such clarity. The trouble with this kind of clarity, however, is that when it's communicated, the other person may not be able to see as much as you saw in it unless they do the homework that you have to go through to see it yourself. Analogies. <laughs> then it's not the, see, it's, it's not the uh, university game. The university game is tell them, make it clear that you told them, remind them that it's going to be on a test, right? Check them on whether or not their memory is sufficient to cover the test material so you can grade their memory. That's all. Not seeing, it's not preparation for seeing or understanding. When you talk about processes and understanding processes, then you're out of it. What is easier to say? Well, I think it's pretty easy to say that an examinees thought that the basic element of the uh, universe was air, and an examander was that it was uh, uh, water, and Thales thought it was water, and, well, you can write that down and you can handle it in, but not the material we've been using. Yes? Would you say part of the problem as well was, really, this was in that this was a, a new direction that, uh, that Western man was taking, in terms of, of trying to talk about physics, that he uh, there wasn't the language for it. It you know, hadn't evolved yet. As a consequence, it was easy to get confused from mm -hmm. from taking certain words and applying them to a different perspective as what they were trying to do. I, I don't see the difficulty with those. For us, I mean, I mean, you know, like now, there's we've evolved all kinds of words to to think, talk about things, so we're not going to have that kind of uh, difficulty. But back then. I mean, a, a lot of the things they were trying to talk about, the words from didn't exist. Oh, I think we certainly have a much richer scientific vocabulary than they do. No, I, I would certainly agree with that. But I don't think that we are keen enough to observe the dynamic forces in nature as they were. Like, um, let, let me criticize what I've been doing, and let me make sure you see it. All right, we're talking about someone who lived at 600. Three people have been living at the 600. Aristotle is 300. The later thinkers that we're talking about, Plutarch, is again right, 200 AD. We're talking about 500 years. Look, from here, 600. This is BC. This is BC. This is AD. What do we know? We know several things. We know that many of these people had literature we no longer have due to fire, destruction, burning of texts, everything else. We know that they had much more than we had. Therefore, the assumption I'm working on is that you can use later thinkers to understand earlier thinkers. And that when you do that, you get a much greater and more interesting insight in what they were doing than if you read Aristotle. What's the problem with Aristotle? He's basically an empiricist. And in today's world, if you know people who think in that channel, empirically, they have a great deal of difficulty moving into the metaphysical and the philosophical. It just happens to be a fact. Can't measure it. Right, can't measure it. It's a logical positivist and et cetera, all of these people. And that's what Aristotle was, basically an empiricist. And um, even his view of philosophy and the forms is particular, particular, always particular. So that what I've done is I've wanted to explore with you not only what these classic thinkers thought about, the, about these early thinkers, but the most philosophically oriented thinkers saw in them. What kind? Well, Simplicius, Plutarch, these people, Actius, these people are, are uh, philosophers in their own right. In what tradition? The Platonic tradition. So therefore, what I'm doing, you must realize that this is the challenge. I would rather say it's better to understand someone in terms of the highest possible vision of what they're doing than a lower, so that you can maximize the possibility of understanding them on the more profound level. That's the challenge, I think, for philosophy, to see always try to maximize your own seeing by seeing as much as you can in what is being said. So that's the defense, and that's the weakness of what I'm doing. So thank you for giving me a chance to take you through this ride. And uh, uh, 
That's why I started this by saying what we really have here is we don't have early thinkers. The dawn of philosophy is already brilliant. It's already compact with so much, but so you need someone brilliant enough to see it. So go to those thinkers who themselves were distinguished by their own profundity. Use them to understand earlier thinkers, and that will maximize your vision. Are we doing injustice to the earlier thinkers? Well, I don't know, since all we know is what Aristotle said about them in terms of the primary source. So Plakinus, Hippolytus, and Diogenes Laertes, they were all Neoplatonists? Neo yeah, or at least in the Platonic tradition. But they were in Alexandria, able to have advantage to Alexandria, I mean, to the libraries there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. yeah, we could assume that, yeah. Or that literature was available, yeah. Like we know many things about the early days that we simply don't have any physical evidence for the writings are not extant anymore. Like we only have a few lines of Zeno's works, but we know he did 40 theses and 30, uh, 40 treatises. Uh, we only have one-tenth of any one of the great tragedians' works. Uh, again and again and again. In one we have 8%, another we have 12% of their writings, etc. cetera. Uh, we haven't been, you know, pet the past hasn't been, a, hasn't been, uh, a repository for the future. It hasn't been that way. Too much destruction, too much burnings. So you know what we have to do? Rediscover it, do it ourselves. That's not bad. Have you uh, spent much time yourself um, trying to take uh, these pre socratics back before to their sources and try to make connections? See, with philosophy you can only deal with words. You can only deal with words. We can, you can certainly Go, and this is the great problem, of course, equally with South American architecture. You know. It's undoubtedly that's some great architecture, shows great, great insight into uh, masonry, into astronomy, uh, undoubtedly and equally into astronomy, uh, mathematics and geometry and measuration. But for philosophy, you need a couple of words like rarefied, <laughs> that'll help, condensing, that will help. So you can't get that from physical remains. As someone said, stones don't speak. We can infer a great deal about mathematics, astronomy, etc. But for the game of philosophy, we need concepts, ideas. And that's why, you know, uh, so much of the money that's being used for research and findings, if we took a fraction of the money being used in archaeological work in the Near East and put it in other areas, we would find, hopefully, something comparable to the Finding Q or the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Nakamati Library and these other things. Well, let me ask a question challenging about something you just said, just as a, a quest for knowledge. Uh, you know, we obviously live in a reductivist kind of uh, premise world, uh, Cartesian, Newtonian um, idea that the rational empiricism is, is the highest, uh, I mean, is our way to know, even though quantum physics is bringing us back around. Nonetheless, uh, you know, in, in many traditions, we're talking here about getting to know the ancients or the roots be, beyond this, and I realize this is going to sound kind of new age, but um, if we limit ourselves to knowing things, to knowing about these things strictly by rational empiricism and reason, uh, then uh, could we not be limited uh, in the sense that? that we're, we're disconnected from the meaning that we've been disconnected from since Descartes. And, and I guess what I'm suggesting as an addition, an additional tool, epistemological tool here is... Yeah, I'm with you. Keep going. Is, I mean, like for instance, the assumption of God forms, which goes way back in Egypt or even in other cultures. I mean, it's not, a, it's not exclusive to them. And what did you call them? Like the assumption of God forms. I mean, they were math... Form, like, F-O-R-M. Yeah, God yeah, forms. Yeah, yeah. You know, like like a, the Kachin tradition, the Hopis, or... Yeah, okay. work. And, and basically to, mm -hmm. and I realized to quantify that is, uh, or even to, to put it into some kind of linear, uh, describable, reasonable way is challenging to say the least. Nonetheless, as a way to get back to sources or at least to search that, what do you think about that? Uh, let me uh, take a different tack for a moment. The primary problem in the history of 
classic philosophy, right, primary problem, breaks into two, Aristotelian, Platonic. But the primary uh, vision of Platonic philosophy, which is really Hellenic philosophy, is in this word, understanding. The, when understanding is directed at the phenomenal, right? by the phenomenal I mean the everyday world trying to master the appearances, then the mind therefore has to develop to match this challenge. Then you have to learn how to think and calculate and categorize and to match this pursuit. In the Platonic philosophical world, this is said to be the misuse of understanding, that you have to turn it and try to understand ultimate concerns. And it's in that shift, there has to be a total shift of the understanding behind which, if there's the energy to sustain it, then that can produce a different kind of clarity of mind where there's the opportunity for noose, as they call it, because it's not reason. See, we use the word reason, and what we often mean is logical, sequential thinking. But reason in the Greek world is not logical, sequential thinking. That's called heuristic reasoning. The are heuristic reasoning. Is, is linear, linear reasoning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when they use the word reason, what that means, right, rational, is often this word, nous, in Greek, right? And uh, when understanding then is continually reflecting on the nature of the ultimate, a clarity emerges that then allows the mind then to function through noose, what they call reason, we don't call it reason. And that is the very condition for the exercise of intuition. So therefore you see metaphysics in the Greek world, not Aristotle, Platonic world, is shifting understanding so you get out of this heuristic logical, what they also call chop logic, or arguing to win, or just sustaining logical arguments, but to try to use the mind to grasp the uh, eternal, uh, primal, the fundamental reality of things, that effort clarifies, that clarification opens up access to noose or mind, so it then functions as insight into the nature of ultimate reality. That's the whole Platonic vision. And that's what Socrates would be arguing against no. the sophists when no. he was suggesting it. No. And that would be the more noumenal world? That is the noumenal world. No. Uh, wouldn't you say, would you say that that would be the arete of the philosopher then? That's the arete, excellence. That's the particular arete of the philosopher. That's right. No. That is excellence. That's what he's doing in the Mino, and that's what he's doing in the Republic, that's what he's doing in the Symposium, and that's what Proclus is doing, that's what Plotinus is doing, that's what Simplicius is doing, that's what... How, how could, you know, getting back to the scholasticism, how could uh, there, there be a generalized uh, theory or belief that, that that was basically Aristotelian uh, input to Thomas Magnus and Thomas Aquinas as opposed to what you said, uh, uh, confusing with Apropos is uh, right as well. well I, I never heard that before. I'm not saying you're wrong, but I no, didn't no. know. No, I could direct you to literature so you can check yourself. Um, um, I mean, it, see, we don't, have, we don't have a philosophical history of Europe. We, we don't have a philosophical history yet uh, because of a variety of factors. It's some, some scholars can put it together. But there isn't, there really isn't one. Here, let, let me uh, put a couple of things for you. Wouldn't it have been so obvious? I mean, you know, Aristotelian versus Platonic thought, in a lot of respects, is so, I mean, diametrically opposed. It would seem fairly obvious if, if there were that kind of muddying of the waters. Um, I'm, again, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just No, no, I'm well, just no, it's not that, it's, you know, it's nothing that you, you need to be familiar, you need to be familiarized with a couple of things. One is that, um, Proclus did this monumental work. Right? Proclus did this monumental work. Right? It is so clear and beautiful and precise, and it's the highest degree rational, that this is 470. They saw the end of the classical world coming. They saw Christianity 
destroying all of the old and the old institutions, everything else. And therefore, Emperor uh, Justinian passed an edict which closed the schools of Athens. The philosophers then were in exile to Syria. Now, when they did that, that's 530. Syria? 530 AD, right. In Syria, they discovered, or the first rec recording, I should say, the first recording of the writings of Dionysius, now called Pseudo Dionysius. The writings of Dionysius were then discovered, and he's the one who had the ten letters, where in one of his letters he says that he was present at the crucifixion of Jesus. So therefore, all of his writings were accepted as, as canonical. More than that, his thought is so pure that it was argued for many years that that writing, the writings of St. Dionysius, were more significant in many ways than Holy Scripture. Therefore, his writings then, his writings then, when St. Thomas Aquinas read them, he saw them as wondrous, and he included in his own Summa Theologica 1,700 quotations or references to this one writer, Pseudo Dionysius. Well, okay. Um, subsequently in history, in the 15th century, a scholar by the name of Valla looked at this and he said it's a forgery. It could not have been written at the time of Jesus. It was likely, and the, the first date it was mentioned in history is 532 in Syria. The philosophers were exiled into Syria. Proclus was the head of Plato's academy. His successor had to flee to Syria. These writings were found for the first time, were discovered, found, or identified in 532. No reference to them before, i.e., some Platonist sitting in the corner whipped up the works called Pseudo Dionysius and passed them off as a forgery. They brought together in a magnific magnificent way, in, in a condensed, a, a fantastically condensed form, form, Neoplatonic thought. That entered into Europe as if it were Christian. St. Thomas Aquinas thought it was real. All right, now, now, see, Aristotle's works weren't in Europe. They came in through Islam, through Islamic Spain. And they were heavily colored, colored by commentaries by Neoplatonists. And therefore, Europe was in a state of very interesting period because therefore St. Thomas Aquinas could use an Aristotle, which really wasn't Aristotle, it was a Neoplatonic influenced Aristotle, a pagan, a forgery, and the Bible to create his primary Summa Theologica. Well, what do you think the impact of this was when it was discovered to be a forgery? It wasn't until 1895 that the Catholic Church agreed that, that Dionysius' writings were a forgery. And there's still some who don't want to accept it because the writings play such a major work, a major role in the culture. Okay, what does that mean? You see, that means then that when Plato and all of the classic works came into Europe for the first time, that wasn't until the 1500s because they came from Constantinople. That's right. The Chino's Academy then translated them, and now they had a problem. How do you reconcile the new Aristotle coming in in Latin with what St. Thomas Aquinas used as Latin sources? A worse problem came. Since this was regarded as genuine, they had a belief from the second century, which was accepted by all of the major Catholic thinkers, called the parallel tradition. And that is to say that there are two traditions in the West. One is rational and the other is divinely revealed. A revealed tradition by faith and a rational tradition which was called partial revelation. And they both came from the same source, Moses. St. Augustine accepted this as true. Lactanius accepted this as true. Uh, what's his name? Clement accepted it as true. All the early church fathers accepted the fact. About these, these two aspects of 
they thought that the revealed religion brought about by Moses and the prophets and Jesus was exactly parallel with Trismegidus, Hermes, Trismegidus, Pythagoras, uh, Aglopolis, a whole bunch of Greeks, and Socrates, because that's how they could explain so many parallels between the two. And would you not agree, the biggest parallel they could find was between Dionysius and later thinkers. Because if this was really written at 500 AD, then, then Dionysius was thought to be written at 30 AD. He anticipated all the writings of the future philosophers, therefore revealed religion anticipated the direction of philosophy by 500 years. Until they discovered it was a forgery. Then the whole thing caved in. See, and when they discovered that these dates, you couldn't maintain these dates, then in Europe at this time, and we're talking about the 17th century, the 17th century accepted this twin tradition. Therefore, it was natural to suspect in, in Europe at that time that you could be both rational and Christian until Isaiah Casabandu came along and showed Isaiah Casabandu, Casabandu, a Frenchman. He showed that these dates were impossible and then the whole thing oh, fell apart. dates were impossible. Yeah, dates were impossible. Yeah. So now you can restate, so you restate what you were saying and then you can see that we can look at it in a different way. So a lot of this, you see, wasn't a war between these different people because they accepted it for so long and then the finally, the crisis therefore in the universities is that both of these could be taught and discovered and, and discussed and printed and were accepted until after that date, then there was no need for the Christians to hold on to it. But, would you say because it was no longer part of their tradition. Wouldn't you say after Descartes became, as the, as the wave started moving more towards uh, the Cartesian Newtonian world, that basically the, the, they started losing more and more of a foundation in, in educated circles for a belief in, uh, in faith, as opposed to, to the tremendously awesome... Uh, well, I, I think there's a way of reading that. Uh, Descartes' introduction, of course, and his uh, uh, discourse on method, the introduction he wrote to the church, um, Fathers of the Church, was that he repeats the fact that the Pope urged philosophers to design arguments to overcome the infidels. See, that's still using philosophers who, are ra who, have, dis who have developed a certain rationality to defend the doctrines of the church. See, that's still within this context. But after the 17th century, it was no longer feasible or necessary or possible or plausible. But, well, but when you say that part of the problem was with the, uh, with the counter-reformation in, in the church's uh, tendency to duplicate the Reformation's literalization of the Bible, that it created more of a divide in terms of the intel intelligent people because they couldn't bind the Bible as, a liter as, as now the church was wanting to make it more literal just so they could maintain their, their, the faithful, mm -hmm. creating more of a divide. Yeah, perhaps, but there's another way of looking at it too. Um, See the Saint Jerome, the Vulgate Bible, translated from the Greek into the Latin by Saint Jerome, was then compared with these new texts coming into Europe for the first time in the 1500s. And among those texts, the people, the Greeks in Constantinople, shipped very early copies of the old, of the New Testament in Greek. And therefore, for the first time, scholars could look at the Greek and then look at what was being translated in the um, Vulgate edition, or St. Jerome's Vulgate edition, they could see so many differences that it was shocking to them. It was really shocking. And that's when uh, Valla said, uh, gentlemen, we need a new Bible. So Martin Luther heard, and he said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll turn out one. He started the Reformation. But they, I mean, in a way, you can say that was just another splinterization, another reason, another faction of educated people being aware of that could then splinter off from, from uh, you know, the church in terms of just the one direction. Um, you know, obviously, it, 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 the Renaissance became uh, a, a consciousness of history as being, as being the classics, the medieval, and the modern. 
And I mean, people became, that became like a concept in terms of history and people would be able to look back. Your, your observation is now about the, I would say, drums version, would just be another contribution to, to looking at history more, uh, you know, more objectively. I, I, yeah, I have, a, I have a different view of history, what went on in history, you know, from Herder, the, fa the father of European history, and uh, how he influenced what was going on. He, he actually was influenced by an Islamic work called uh, the Maquadima. I mean, Ib Ibn Khaldun wrote a work called the Maquadima, which represent the first religious view of culture and society, because they had to devise a way of understanding the many diverse cultures that they conquered under one faith. Well, that vision, that vision, then fed Vico and Herder, because Europe has many different cultures, and therefore they were thinking of a world view that would encompass it, just as in the Islamic world view of history, they were able to bring it together under one faith. So, so European view of history is totally different than the classic view of history. Can you spell that? Oh, look, look, here. Ibn Khaldun. All right, and I don't know how to, I, I'd risk spelling Maquadima, M-A-Q-U-A-D-D-A-H-A-M or something like that. Ibn Khaldun, uh, you got me on that. I think, I, my, my memory serves me correctly, I think it's tw uh, 12th century, 13th century, something like, it's close. His father was a physician, he was a physician, he traveled all the way to different places. Major thinker. His history started European history. You see, the Greek view of history is totally different, and most moderns reject the classical view of history, which is that there's something significant going on in the present, and if you can understand the patterns in it, you'll see that those patterns reveal a recurring pattern throughout history, and therefore you can use it in some way to guide you. Oh, yeah, well, oh, the, that's the, different the church side is a linear perspective, yeah, yeah. as opposed to the Greek side is, is cyclical. Uh, well, cyclical in a different way, though. Cyclical, to me, suggests that the same things are going through again and again. Their view, yeah, their view is rather that in this flow of history, if you have a trained mind, you can see certain patterns, and these patterns are a mirror of an archetypal pattern, and those that can see that then can better understand the processes and take advantage of it. You're describing uh, one of the major premises of astrology. Yeah, that's right. Great, thank you, a lot of fun. Thank you for your reflections. And uh, we'll do it more fun with Heraclitus, who is and will represent the problem of Aristotle most clearly. <laughs>